a short time ago, President Trump dropping a climate deal bombshell. As of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. This includes ending the implementation of the nationally determined contribution and, very importantly, the Green Climate Fund, which is costing the United States a vast fortune. I'm not very surprised by this at all. <laughs> no, no one should be. Um, Donald Trump candidate uh, ran on the anti-globalist agenda. This, by definition, is a globalist idea, the Paris Climate Accord, 195 countries. And we're going to get into the specifics of it in, in a couple of minutes, but no one should be surprised. That, and don't be surprised also the coincidence of a brand new stock market high on the very day that we pull out, because pulling out of the Paris Accord is very, very good for American business. We can argue whether he should get back in with a better deal or not, but certainly business leaders um, feel optimistic that this is a good idea for the country. I think get back in with a better deal, but involving Congress, as you would with a treaty, which essentially is what this was, even though technically not, should have been always treated that way. That's my opinion. Yeah, and I think most people would agree with you there. Here's the thing. I'm not bothered at all by this. This is exactly what he ran on. Eric's right. And even those that, that, that question, you know, Donald Trump and his issues with climate change or whatever, the point is the deal itself wasn't mm -hmm. good. Every deal is not good. And I think a lot of people don't really wrap their heads around that um, because the idea of a deal sounds like a good thing. It sounds positive and productive, but a deal's only as good as the terms it's based on. And this one has unenforceable bad terms that are not productive for American citizens. All right. All right. Well, let's meet today's specialist. She is a New York Times bestseller. She's a Fox News contributor, and she's editor for townhall.com, but she specializes in hunting and rafting on the Colorado River. Katie Pavlich is here, and he is the 1987 Brooklyn Spelling Bee champion, <laughs> the subject of the graphic novel Ego and Hubris, and he's a columnist for The Observer, but he specializes in North Korea. That's right, he's the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. Michael Malice is here also. All right, Katie, a lot of people are saying that the whole world is now going to be on fire. Do you yeah. think that that's true? No, <laughs> it, it is not. Uh, the hysteria surrounding the United States leaving the Paris Climate Accord really is incredible, especially considering all the hysteria we've seen so far with the Trump administration. We have commentators at different networks saying this is the day that the United States stepped back and is, is no longer the leader of the free world. You have Tom Steyer, who of course is a big climate change proponent, saying uh, that the president has committed an act of treason against the American people for pulling out of this accord. Um, that's not true. And when you look at the details of what this agreement would have required, you know, 400,000 manufacturing jobs in this country gone, not to mention maybe millions potentially down the road. Uh, a decrease of $20,000 per family of four in terms of household income. Three trillion dollars of, of lost GDP, according to, to the agreement. And the issue also is the international community seems very upset that we're leaving. Well, what if the United, if the United States pulls out? Well, then other countries might pull out. Well, first of all, that shows that we're still leaders in the world, <laughs> number one. And second of all, the United States for a very long time has been the funder of pet projects and slush funds for the international community that actually don't do a lot of good and don't handle the problem that it's supposed to. I think that the president sent that message on the campaign trail that those days are over and this is the first step to stop American taxpayer funding to go towards one of those slush funds that really wasn't going to solve the problem of climate change. Right, absolutely. And I, again, climate change, I am someone who certainly believes that it's real. I just really don't buy into the idea that regulations are always the answer. I'm more one of those market people, I think things like property rights could get involved. And also, you can't have all these regulations if you want to create new businesses. And that includes businesses that are green energy. So I, I, I would like to see there be some sort of deal, though, Eric. Something you said was if we get back in, I would like to see there be some sort of deal, but follow the proper, following the proper channels of a treaty. Let's just talk a little bit. Katie points out that uh, both the Heritage Foundation and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimate the GDP lost somewhere around two and a half or three trillion dollars over 10 years. That is substantial. But here's why. I mean, let me explain exactly why it costs us GDP. 
when a, a lot of this is focused on the automobile industry. So all these car companies are being told they have to increase cafe standards. It's their miles per gallon standards. So they're forced to make a lighter and lighter car. Costs a lot more money to use aluminum in a car than steel. So it costs them more. That goes on to the consumer. But also these cars are less safe. So the insurance costs are going up to, to, to consumers as well. Um, also, natural gas is being forced. Now, if you're, if you're under the accord, we'd have to pollute less, so we'd have to move away from coal, which is one of our cheapest, most abundant fuel sources in America, into a more expensive fuel source. That means our electric bills are going to go right. up as well. As these costs are translated to the consumer, GDP goes down. You have less money to in your be, pocket. But Michael, spend. I want to get Michael in this too. But here's my thing, Eric. I don't mind it being more expensive because I think to do the right thing by our, our system, our ecosystem, it's going to maybe be more expensive. That's not even my problem with the deal. You know what it is? It's not enforceable. Those that don't uh, agree to it, those that violate the terms of this agreement, how are you going to enforce it's it? It's right. the same and we're the kind of country just, just that worse. ends up actually yeah. following through on we, it. We were going to eat most of the cost of there, a big portion of the cost of this, as I, I think we're the third largest polluter, second or third largest polluter, the largest polluter, China gets to continue to pollute more and more and more for 13 years going forward. But I do think it's, it's insane. I do think it's important, Michael, to show that we do still care about this. We don't want to completely abandon look after clean energy, green energy, because that is where the rest of the world is going. If we just want to stick with coal, we'll be by ourselves sticking with coal, and that's not a good thing. Well, we're by ourselves using feet and yards, and that's pretty <laughs> fine with me. See, I agree with <laughs> Katie. This yeah. isn't about leadership. This is about obedience and submission of the American government, the American people to a new world order. Now, here's how I determine what the facts are here. If you look at markets, price determines information. If aluminum goes up, that means there's either less demand, uh, there's more demand or less supply. If you look at all these predictions, they say that we're all going to be underwater. We should have been underwater in the 90s. Mm -hmm. If this was all true, beachfront property prices would be collapsing because all those people in the real estate industry would be selling because they're thinking the long game and they're like, well, these, this is going to be worth yep. in 20 years and we're not seeing that. So I trust the people. The have views are too nice. I, 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 have, I, trust <laughs> have, I trust people who have skin in the game, not the coal industry people right. and not, certainly not people who want the government to control every aspect of our lives. Listen, if you agree with the French proposals, put on a beret, go to, go to Calais and pay 85% of your income to the French government. Understand yeah. this also. Elon Musk said that if we pulled out of the, um, the Paris Accord, that he was going to pull himself self off of some of the advisory boards that he's on with the Trump administration. Think about that for a second. The guy who runs an electric car company, owns right. an electric car company, Just funded, subsidized, subsidized by the largely by the U.S. <laughs> right. taxpayer, mm -hmm. no less, wants us to move away from fossil fuel right. generated uh, burning cars into right into his his mm -hmm. right into his showroom right? bit, buy one of and, our and that, that goes to but, exactly but, the point but talk he, about this though what, how do you produce electricity well it goes exactly with through coal, coal right yeah. exactly um, but that goes exactly to the point of is he really interested in the environment and clean energy or is he interested in getting rich in electricity electric cars because it benefits him if he was really interested in helping the environment which I think there are a lot of people in the Trump administration who are America by the way is going to decrease its emissions without the Paris right. Accord we have decreased our emissions more than any other country in the world but if he really cared about the environment he would stay as an advisor despite not getting his way on the Paris Climate Agreement. A bit of a conflict, I agree with you there, Katie. And also, back, because the deal itself just bugs me, uh, in the same way that the uh, Iran deal bugged me. It's a bad deal. Good mission, good intentions, bad, unenforceable terms of the deal. France, Germany, and Italy already saying that the deal, quote, cannot be renegotiated. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Every <laughs> deal can, by yes, definition, can. Right. be renegotiated. Can we type, touch on one yeah. other thing? Who signed this deal? Who's, who thought oh, it was a great idea for us to reduce that would be our emissions by 28 percent, pay the vast majority of the money that's going, a, a transfer of wealth from us to developing nations? Who did that? President, President Obama. Obama. Thank you, sir. Right. One more thank you, President Obama. All right. Obama. Okay. Well, not surprisingly, oh. the media are pouncing <laughs> on the irreparable damage they claim the president will cause by pulling out of the climate deal. Take a listen. And with the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement, scientists are in agreement, or a majority of them anyway, that we are going to see temperatures rise. Let's first look scientifically what that means. Well, rising seas. We could see the seas uh, continue to rise. And we could see flooding in major cities such as New York City to Shanghai. Deadlier heat waves would be more uh, abundant. We'd see droughts, wildfires, mass extinction in the natural world. Ecosystems would be disrupted. Coral reefs would bleach out in the oceans. And get this, Jake, low-lying countries such as the Marshall Islands would disappear entirely. 
Ebony, he's saying this about the deal. We're talking <laughs> about a deal. Right. We're not talking about ultimately actions or what's ultimately going to happen that, in terms of emissions that, that and regulations. We're talking about a specific deal. Without this specific deal, all that's going to happen? I feel like no. And if you listen to him, it sounds like it's the rapture. You're expecting exactly. half the people just vanish from the face of the earth. We've been hearing these predictions for at least 30 years. Uh, none of this has happened. And at no point are they like, wait a minute, maybe we got something wrong. The idea that climate change is naturally not, uh, automatically man-made and the idea that it's automatic like a catastrophe are two logical leaps that they're making yeah. whenever you talk about right. this issue. I feel like I was watching let's, Jack Van Empey for a while. <laughs> let's let's slow it down though, Mike. So, so I agree, that's, that's a bit far of a leap. But obviously, I do think there are things we can and should be doing to be more responsible consumers sure. of our earth right. and globe. But that, to cap, I mean, everybody, I think we're all in agreement here, that is very different than applauding this as a good deal. And let me make one more point. If Trump pulled out of the agreement and said unilaterally we're still going to meet these goals, he would still get attacked because what they really want is for the U.S. to have some kind of international consensus as opposed right. to us doing anything of our own uh, volition. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't mind us having consensus personally, but, but not when it doesn't have well, an actual you benefit. Have to, you have to look at the end result. Is the Paris Climate Accord actually going to reduce the Earth's right. temperature mm -hmm. by four degrees? Absolutely not. And this idea that they have all these predictions, which I was confused, is that Al Gore or was that an anchor from a, another network there? All those predictions I'm pretty sure I saw Al Gore make in 2002 when his, his right. film that came out, An Inconvenient Truth, that was completely debunked, yet used in classrooms across the country to sell climate change. As you said, in the 80s and the 70s, we were told that the earth was going to freeze. Right. He was talking about rising uh, sea levels. I'm from Arizona. <laughs> Arizona used to be under an ocean. You can find seashells at the top of the Grand Canyon. Yes, the climate changes. It's been changing for a very, very long time. Yes, man may have some kind of impact on it, but to act like some international community is going to use American taxpayer dollars to reduce the Earth's temperature by four degrees is a fantasy land, and I'm glad that the president is not. But, but if you Amen, want to play sister. fantasy land, that's fine. And if you have a, you, you, you will get behind a president that says, let's let's do this fantasy land, mm -hmm. but. As long as everyone is playing with the same set of rules, in other words, we can't be forced into four or three, I'm sorry, three trillion dollars of reduced GDP while China continues to, to eat our lunch in business, uh, in, in manufacturing, and, and put us at a competitive disadvantage of China when they're going to be allowed, think about this, they're the number one polluter on the planet. Right. They're going to be allowed to increase their pollution for 13 but more years. A we're required to pull back or we're fined. There's a we difference between pollution and climate change. Right. And I think they mix the two. Nobody wants to be a polluter. Right. No two. one wants to be a polluter. We can reduce pollution, but this idea of climate change embodying everything doesn't really add up. And to Eric's point, even when China does continue to do that, even if when it, the day comes where they're restricted, how do we enforce that it's an unenforceable deal and well you know, this deal didn't have any enforcement mechanisms in it that's so what maybe some of those would have been a, a good start for that okay